look at how it's together in your life, I'm going to share with you at least, I've got at least five real life examples, if not about a 50 or a 100, but I've got five already down on paper of people that we've worked with who have put those gifts together, those passions, that temperament, and gone out and produced ministries that are changing lives to this day. And so we want to be working on that and uh, bringing that together. So let's take a look at this. So we're going to be discovering uh, how you've been created. Who are you meant to be? Our creator. You have? Our creator. Who? Our creator. Our creator. You're way ahead of the game. You, you're, you're, in the, you're in the one millionth percentile of people out there. Bless your heart. Edie, you're right. That's where we want to get. That's not where most people are. How are most people defined as to who they are? And your role. Your role in life. What others have said about you. Yeah, I mean, look at the list. We can go down through that. That's that DNA test you can take. Discover your ancestry. Why are those? They're selling in the millions. Why? And they're not very accurate. Matter of fact, you take one one day and take the same one the next day and take another one the next day, they're all going to be different. There's not that much accuracy, but people love it. Oh, I'm from Europe. I'm from Northern Europe. You know, I'm a German. I'm an Irishman. You know, in my case, I'm an American Indian too. I mean, you add all that up, big deal. That doesn't define who you are right now. So we get caught up in that stuff. We also get caught up in what our parents have said about us. I know lots of adults whose parents are dead and they're still carrying the grief that dad never said, I love you. Mom never said, I think you're worthwhile or something like that. There's too much of that out there. Siblings, that's always a big one. You know, brothers and sisters say about you. Here's the one most people hate, their high school nickname. Almost everybody got a nickname in high school from somebody. And you go back to class reunions and you could see people cringing because it's 50 years later, but you're still known as Tom the Bomb or whatever the nickname may have been, all right? Your income. Many people get defined by their income. By the way, in your neighborhood, how many 90-year-old men have 23-year-old wives? Daniel, put your hand down. Why, why isn't that happening everywhere? It happens in Hollywood all the time. It happens in business all the time. I mean, the Kardashians are making an industry out of it all the time. Why don't we see that on a regular basis? Because why are these women marrying these older men? Because they're deeply in love with 90-year-old men? Money. You take the money away, they will not be there. All right? So I told Deanne, if you die, I'm going to buy a lottery ticket. Only <laughs> kidding. Only kidding. Okay, your looks. Many of us get defined by whether we're good looking or not good looking. Whether we think we're handsome or we think we're not handsome. Uh, I've been amazed at the number of women I've worked with that are anorexic, uh, who look in the mirror and I remember one gal when I was at Trinity, absolutely gorgeous lady. She couldn't see that when she looked in the mirror and she literally starved herself to death. Literally, because she was too fat. Yeah, she weighed 92 pounds. And she was five foot 10. Imagine that for a moment how bad that is. So, how does the Bible passages define you? How are you defined? Well, there are a lot of ways to define you. Let's take a look here. If you look on your material, I'm, we're going to look at the verse and then I'm going to ask you a question. So here we go. I'll read the first one. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. How does the Bible define you in that verse? What does it say? Look at your material and underline what it says what it says about you and then tell me created in the image of god joy has been created in the image of god what in the world does that mean they should and we are meant to be a reflection of his presence living within us and we are created like him where we have a free will we can make choices, we can do, unfortunately, good or bad. I mean, there's a lot of things there. So that says a great deal about it, and there's a great deal here. So created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. When I had my five confirmation girls at Living Word, remember I told you at the beginning of the year they didn't know Matthew from Mark, Luke, or John? 
we worked I threw out the catechism and I said we're going to work on the Bible verses we're going to teach you who you are we're going to teach you why you're here and I remember I think it was my third to last class I said to one said to the girls 30 years from now I'll be in heaven you will be middle-aged with families who are you 30 years from now and one little girl perked right up she goes I'm a child of Jesus I was made in his image Think about that. Think about what that means for dating for young women. Think that what that means about having, you know, today our society says, hey, come on, we have to have abortion. You can't stop these kids from having sex. And you know what? That's straight from the pit of hell. When I was in college, 1968 to 72, uh, I didn't know Jesus in a personal way, but I grew up in the church and I saw my brother get his future wife pregnant out of wedlock. I saw the, uh, my sister get pregnant out of wedlock and I thought, I can't do that to mom and dad. I can't. But now, 68 to 72, it was called the era of free. And there are a lot of willing girls, folks. There are a lot of willing, as well as willing guys out there for sex. You know why I didn't? Because I didn't want to create a problem. I could see the end from the beginning and I knew that I could stop anywhere along the way. I've had people tell me, Pastor, we got kissing, and I just couldn't stop myself. And I would say to people, quit lying. You could stop anywhere along the way. You chose not to stop. There is a difference. If a young woman understands she's created in the image of God, she can stop anywhere along the way. She doesn't have to be caught up in that. Or in a young man. How about Jeremiah? I need a reader. Who can read my Jeremiah passage? Out loud, anybody. Now take that verse and apply it to yourself. Because those verses really do apply as they come from the old to the new and then to the new. What does it say about you? What does it say about God and his relationship with you? He has always known you. He's always known you. How long has he known you, Hal? Since before I was formed in the womb. Before you were ever created in the womb, before the, the sperm and the, the egg came together, he already knew you. He knows who you are. Now, does that mean we can fool him? Does he know why he created us? Our challenge of life is to find that out and to do it. That's why we're here. So yes, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. You have been set apart. Lord has already set you apart and said, you have a special place in the kingdom of God and a special purpose. How about John 1.12? I need another reader. We got several verses we're going to look at this morning. Yet to all who did receive him, he, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Okay, tell me how the Bible defines you now. You're a child of God. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. I hear everywhere today, in every church, in every synagogue, in every mosque, we're all children of God. Is that what the Bible's saying? No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. We're a creation. It doesn't say we're children. Because children, what does children mean? What can a child, what can your children do that I can't do in your house? Tell me, what can, your, what can one of your children do in your house that I don't have a right to do because I'm not a blood relative? Can I, can I dip into your bank account? Because I have needs? But most kids feel they can talk to mom and dad and get the money and do that. Can I just drop by any time I want to have dinner? How many of you have your kids drop by and say, hey, you're only a blood relative. Get out. You're not eating here. No, no. You'd welcome them. When you're a child, you are then part of the blood of the kingdom of God. So that's what the Bible's talking about here. We become children of God. You're a child of God. Romans 6.6. 6. I need another reader. What does it say about you and me and who we are? What's happened to us? We are sinful, but something more has happened beside that, because everybody is. Go ahead. We've been crucified with Jesus. If you claim Jesus your Lord and Savior, your old self has been crucified with him. No longer just you. 
It's him now living in you, and that makes you a unique individual. We should no longer then be slaves to sin. We have the power to say no. I know it's hard. <laughs> Believe me. I remember one great book I saw, I Can Resist Anything But Temptation. <laughs> I wish I had come up with that title. The reality is, you and I now have the power to say no to sin. Where I have so many of my friends who couldn't. Back in college, again, the era of free love, I worked at the campus radio station. I was a disc jockey. Big surprise, right? Anyway, I, I had a friend from New York. He was a Jewish young man, and I met him. He was also a disc jockey, and he was so excited about all this free love. And I said, wait a minute, there is no such thing as free love. I said, you got to be careful when you're dating. You don't want to get a young woman pregnant that you don't love or you don't want to spend the rest of your life with and then be tied down. you got to be smart and control yourself. He goes, oh, it's the free love era. About a year later, I walk in the radio station. He's sitting in the corner over, you know, over there with his head down and, and his hands. And I said to one of the guys, what's wrong? And he goes, well, I don't know. He's been sitting over there moping. I go over and I say, Bill, what, what's, what's wrong? He goes, I'm an idiot. Well, I was 19 years old, and I said, I know you're an idiot. <laughs> what's the problem? He said, I found out this weekend I have three different young women pregnant. They don't know one another. And moms and dads all want me to come over for dinner Saturday. <laughs> so what he's, he created a dilemma for the rest of his life. He's got children out there today that probably don't know him, or if they have, they, you know, they've done the DNA and they've tracked him down. You know, what he, you know how he solved his problem? He disappeared and left three young women with three babies and children to raise because he couldn't say no. He didn't know who he was. If you know who you are in Christ, guess what? You can say no. If I became a single pastor, don't do anything. If I became a single pastor, and I started dating, would you expect me to be moral? Would you expect me to honor Jesus in my dating life? Would you expect me to be shacking up for the weekend with a member of the congregation? If you expect me to do it, why don't we expect every Christian to do it? Because that's the message for the entire Bible. We're all capable if we give ourselves over to the Lord. First Corinthians 6, one verse, any reader. Good and loud, build it out. Okay, what's it say about you? Oh my goodness, you're united with him in spirit. That is, you literally can have his mind. And quite frankly, I believe this also saying you can have his power, which we rarely exercise in Christianity. But it's all there. The problem is we don't put it to work. Why don't we? Because most people don't know this. Did you know before you came here this morning that you're already united in mind with Jesus Christ? Most people don't, right? But we should, because that's what the scripture says. A couple more. First Corinthians 12, 27. Anybody? Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Who are you? Oh, is that, a, is that a nice metaphor? You're the body of Christ? Is that what it's saying? Is this a metaphorical language in the New Testament? Is this a nice simile type of thing? No, what is it saying? You literally are his body in the world. How is the work of Jesus going to get done if you're the hand and you don't work? Or you're the foot and you don't go? Or you're the heart and you don't, you know, share with others? So each of you is a part of the body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Only a couple more. Anybody? I need another reader. Oh, this is loaded. Your identity is incredible here. This is your DNA, folks. What's your DNA in this verse? What's it say about you and me as believers? Go ahead. Yeah, look at that. Your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Looks good, doesn't it? Here it is, right? But I can see it's in you, too. You have the, pow the power of the Holy Spirit in you. And... How were you brought into this? You were bought at a price. His shed blood is what sets you free. You're valuable. He thought you were valuable enough to die for you. Galatians 3. 
One or two more readers. We're almost done with this part of it. Go ahead. Jan, please. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What's your DNA there? I've got to have it a little louder, folks. You got it? Yeah. Look at this here. If you were baptized into Christ Jesus, you have clothed yourself with Jesus himself. It's no longer your identity. It's you and Jesus together, and it's his identity shining through you. Think about that for a moment, how powerful that is. We begin to think in those terms. All right, almost done. Ephesians 5.1. He predestined us to adoption to be his children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will. So we've also been adopted. Congratulations. And you now have his name. I remember one comedian, Jen and I went to a conference, and he was a Christian comedian. Guy was hilarious. And uh, we were laughing our heads off. He said, now, this was back a couple of election cycles ago. He, says, he said, I was going to do a meeting. He said, who do you think was going to be at that meeting? Ross Perot, one of the richest guys in the world. And for days, I kept saying to my wife, what am I going to say when I meet him? How am I going to respond? How am I going to... And he said, finally, the day came, and there's Ross Perot. And Ross is walking up to me, and he goes, hi there, young man. And I walk up, and I go, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> of course. I mean, if you're related to the right people, hey, that's a big deal, right? But if you're not, you can be left out in the cold. You're related. You're a child of Jesus Christ. By adoption, he's put his name on you. What does adoption mean when you adopt a child in the United States? How much of their family are you after they're adopted? 100%. 100%. And that includes inheritance. That includes title. That includes everything. It's all there. It's all part of it. All right? Colossians 3, 1 to 3. Okay, let's do a DNA thing here. What, what does it say about you and me? The oh, my goodness, yes. You know, you've been raised with Christ. We're called to do what? Set our mind on things above. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. Congratulations, you're already dead. <laughs> but you've been raised already to a new life by the power of the Holy Spirit. So all of that is there for you. So there's a lot of these passages. Uh, one more I want to share, 1 Peter 2, 9. Most people are not familiar with this verse as much as they should be. But you, talking about you, believers, but you are a chosen people. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Israel's the chosen people. This has got to be wrong. Peter's wrong, isn't he? No, no, no. He says you're also the chosen people. You are the chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. Man, you're clergy. You're a holy nation. You're God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Guess what, folks? All the titles that were given to Israel have now been given to you as a believer. Every one of them. And that means we have no less responsibility proclaiming the name of Jesus. But again, would you ever guess most Christians understood that? What do most Christians think the church is for? I'm serious. What do most Christians perceive the church to be or what it's for? Why do they go to church? So they can be a holy nation? A chosen people? A royal priesthood? I've never, I can't remember in all the years I've been a pastor, I've, I've never had somebody come up and say, and, to me and say, you know, that sermon didn't really help me become a royal priesthood. It hasn't happened yet. Russ, have you had that yet? Not yet. It's coming. From this point on, it better come. The point is, think about that for a moment. What you and I have been called to be and do. The titles and the DNA is astounding. And yet most of us don't know it. How many of your grandkids know this? How many of you sat down and taught your grandkids their identity in Jesus Christ? Said, I want you to know who you are. 
You know, our grandson, Bo, who you've met many times, uh, lived with us for a long time. He and I did this every day for years. And even though his mother is probably going to go to prison because there were six DWI and all the problems, and she's a terror from word one, and she's been a problem from the very beginning, and she hasn't seen him in two years and doesn't care if she sees him or not. Think how that makes you feel. He said to me one day, he said, Grandpa, I miss my mom. I wish she loved me. However, I know who I am. I belong to Jesus. This is how you stop teen suicide. This is how you give kids reasons to live. This is how you keep kids away from drugs when they know who they are and why they're here. They're not here to become a famous football player. They're not here to become a millionaire. They are here to proclaim the name of Jesus. And we don't do enough of that. And 1 John 3, 1 to 2. See what great love the Father has lavished in us that we should be called, what? The children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what will be has not been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's another good identity thing, who you are. Back to that child of God again. All right, now we're going to stop there for a moment before we talk about biblical purpose. We're going to look at two passages there. First of all, tell me who you are. You're a child of God. Mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. Royal priesthood. You're a royal priesthood. Oh, my goodness. Go ahead. You create. He should be hanging on your wall. You have Christian pictures in your home. Take them down. Put this up instead. Put this up instead. I love the, I've got the one of Jesus hanging in the wall where he's, he's for pilot and he's looking out at the crowd. I, I look at that every day uh, during my prayer time. And it's great. I feel good when I look at that and know how much he loved me in that. But you know what? I need to hear this every day over and over again. Because I know who Jesus is, but I'm not always sure I know who I am or why I'm here or what I'm supposed to do, but the Bible tells us. Questions about your identity and why that is so important and why you're going to now teach them to your kids and grandkids from this day on every chance you get. This is critical, folks, and this is what most of us miss in the church today. We don't get it. Now, two passages about your biblical purpose because there are two things that are important. Who are you? Why are you here? I've been with a lot of people at the moment of death, over 50. And I would say that this is the predominant questions that come at the end of life. Why was I here at this point in time? Why did Jesus put me in the world at this time? I could have been born back during the Roman era. Why, why now? And what was I supposed to do with my life? It's tragic when you hear that out of people on their deathbed, although you can help them. The point is they should have known this 40 years before. But they didn't. Look at uh, what we have here. Jan, you're my good reader. Would you read 2 Corinthians for us? All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to him and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, one of my favorite passages, and again, one that's pretty much overlooked. When Jesus said, back on how long ago, I want St. Paul's Lutheran Church, 1901 Portland, you know, South Minneapolis, I'm going to bring them into existence. This is why he did it. And quite frankly, folks, this is the only major reason you and I exist. I mean, I believe in feeding the hungry. I've done a lot of that. But who else feeds the hungry? Who else out there in their, our society feeds the hungry? Oh, the atheists, the Buddhists. You know, you go right down the list. All right? I mean, I believe in giving, helping people with housing. We've helped resettle a lot of people and get them into housing. But that's not our major task. 
We're the only ones in the entire universe who have this ministry. Look at what we're called to do. We have been given a ministry. You are a minister of the gospel of reconciliation between sinful people and a righteous God revealed in Jesus Christ. You are the minister of the gospel. You have been entrusted with that message of reconciliation. You better know the message so you can share it with others compellingly. And they can hear it. Also, you're an ambassador for Christ. You get to speak for him in this world. Um, I do a, almost a daily blog. And Jan's certain I'm going to get shot one of these days because I hold nothing back. I don't play games. I talk about the political situation, what's going on in terms of how it responds or reflects Jesus or doesn't, what's happening in our society. The problem is, and I had a guy call me the other day. He said, I want to do a radio program with you. I have a radio program. And he said, you're one of the few people I know that have the guts to speak the truth. I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be. Every one of us should be. Do you realize if we all stood up and began to speak the truth in our neighborhood and elsewhere at our work, even if we lost our job? Why do you think Jan got lost her job at Minneapolis Public Schools after being a principal for over 20 years? You know why she got fired? Not fired. fired. You got let go. They didn't renew I your retired. contract. Well, she technically retired, but it was a push. They pushed her to retire. Why, Jan? Why did they do that? Ah, I'm not going to teach the curriculum that deals with transgendered, or I've got two daddies at home. It cost her a job, cost her a lot of money. That's what we're supposed to be doing, folks. We're not to be living comfortably. We're supposed to be making a difference. So when we are ambassadors of Christ, he's making his appeal through us. Remember the story I told you about Sophia, one of my other confirmation kids? Mom called us after confirmation ended over at Living Word, said, can you and Jan come over for dinner on Friday? We did. Had a nice dinner with her family. Sophia, who's now 13, and the kids went outside. Mom says, do you know what you did to my daughter in confirmation? <laughs> I go, no, what did I do to your daughter? You changed her life. What do you mean? I got a call earlier this week from a public school teacher. The teacher was really worked up and said, we gave your daughter a test this week, and all the kids on what they're going to do with their life. Do you know what she wrote down? <laughs> Mom said, I, I don't know. What did she write down? She said, your daughter Sophia wrote on her paper, I am an ambassador of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many 13-year-olds you know can do that? I don't know too many adults that can do that. It has nothing to do with me. It wasn't my brilliance that made it happen. It had everything to do with exposing these kids to the truth of God's word and helping them connect with how they bring this out in the culture. And I tell you, I uh, got an uh, email from mom the other day. It's been a year and a half now. And she said, Sophia still is on fire like she's never seen before. This is a little introverted girl and still speaking out about her faith in Jesus. This girl will make a difference in this world. She caught it. We need to help our kids catch it. This is very important. So you're an ambassador of the gospel. You know this one. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit teach them to observe all I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. Look there. Your job is to? I thought it was to have potluck dinners. How much time do Christians spend on potluck dinners compared to spend on making disciples? I'm serious. I'm not putting anybody down. Why do we do that? Either we don't know what we're supposed to be doing, or it's just simpler. You're not here for any other reason than to be making disciples out of others and bringing them into the kingdom of God. Well, if we're doing less than that, we're not fulfilling what the Lord called us to do. Now, each of us does it uniquely. That's why we're looking at temperament, passion, and spiritual gifts, and we'll explain how that works. So here you're to make disciples, baptize and teach them. We know how the passage goes. All right, so let's look at a couple of things. Jesus is designed for the church. First of all, the church is his body in the world. It's not a metaphor. We are literally his body in the world. That's number one. Number two, we are brothers and sisters through the shed blood of Jesus. Folks, we're related. We're related. And the tragedy of Christianity is that it's been 2,000 years since Jesus spoke these words and rose from the dead, and the church still hasn't caught on, and most Christians still haven't caught on, and we still segregate ourselves all the time from one another because of color, background, or something else stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. And yet we do it with great regularity. 
Also, we have passed from death to life. Congratulations. You will never die. Did I say that? No, who else said that? Jesus said that. John 5, 24, what's he say? You know, whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Your relatives who love Jesus quit breathing. They didn't die. They went on to the kingdom of God, and they're as much alive today as you and I are, even more so. My mother, who died October 15th, is in heaven. She's still looking for the organ. She wants to play it, but she's dancing, she's singing, and she's with the saints. And I believe that with all my heart. Also, the church is to be a living reflection of his reality. And so we have to ask, how do we look in the mirror? I think one of the biggest things we can do is this. I mean, how many of us say, well, yeah, I know, Howard, I'm not perfect. And everybody would say, you old. <laughs> we all agree. Quit saying that. Quit saying that, folks. That's the stupidest thing we could say. We already know that. Here's what we say is, I was wrong, and I sinned against you. Please forgive me. I repent. How much of that do we see in Christianity? You know, our greeting time on Sunday morning here, it's wonderful. But there are people, even in this country, I don't want to talk to one another. Why is repentance happening? We're out of God, we're creating his image, and we have a mission. Why aren't we repenting for one another? We're asking forgiveness, seeking to be Jesus. Glad you're not calling me a pastor, right? Just the president of the congregation again. But uh, the point is simply, play games with Christianity. We haven't been serious. Time. We're just especially designed to work together like a like puzzle pieces. You have your gifts, I have mine, we all work together. We are made to reach others that do not know him, calling them to repentance and faith and training them to be lifelong disciples who in turn make disciples of others. Do you realize you're a disciple? Because somebody in the generation prior to you was a disciple. Somebody in the generation before them was a disciple. Before them was a, gen, you know, was a disciple. And the discipleship kept getting passed down. Could have come through strangers, come through blood relatives. You are you're just as much as your DNA goes back to your heritage of German or Scandinavian or whatever, you are connected to the first century of the apostles. I mean, that's an awesome thought when you think about it. We are actually connected. All right, three steps to discover how to fit into Jesus' plan. Today we'll look at temperament in just a few moments. We're also going to then look at passion. That's another big one. And spiritual gifts. Now, I've done this for 40 years. Uh, for a long time, we just did spiritual gifts. And I found that was inadequate. Because if you don't understand your temperament, you'll misread others. If you don't understand your passion, you'll never know why you have this drive inside and what to do with it. And it will seem impractical, and everybody will say, oh, come on, you're just a dreamer. You know, don't, you can't do those kind of things. <laughs> of course you can. All right, here's temperament. I'm going to give you a definition. Your temperament is your basic nature, especially as it is shown in the way you react to situations or other people. All right, that's who you are. Your temperament is your basic nature, especially as shown in the way that you react to situations for other people. Now, you're going to take the temperament indicator that's in your material right now. It's, too, it's front and back page. Let me explain this to you. And you're going to score it while we're still here this morning. Do not think of yourself at work. Do not think of what mom and dad told you to do. Do not think of what your spouse would tell you to do in these situations. Think about a leisurely Saturday with nobody's, no pressure and nobody telling you what to do. How would you respond to these situations? All right, let me help you. I'll walk through it with you. This is what we call a must score 10 system. In other words, you're going to choose between one side or the other. That's why the or is there. Either this one applies to you, like the first one. You seem to act first and think and reflect. Or you think first, reflect, and then act on things. So you've got to decide which one you are, and on a scale of 1 to 10, you need to put a number next to how strongly you think that works in your life. Stay away from 5. Do not go to 5. You know, I hear people say, well, I'm not an INTJ, I'm an IXXJ. No, you aren't. You just don't know your temperament. 
you will always be one or the other to a degree. So you could put, if you were the person that acts first, thinks and reflects later, you might put a six over here. On the other side, you'd put a four, four right? Because the two have to add up to ten. <laughs> Get that coffee going, folks. All right. All right. So what we're going to do, you've got several questions. What I'm going to have you do is you go through each four questions. Two in the front, two in the back. Go through, answer a question, do the four, then add up your numbers down here on the bottom. See where it says score I, uh, E, score I on the first one? So you add up those four numbers. If you've got four tens, four tens are 40. That would be 40. If you have, you know, four zeros, that would be zero. All right, make sense? Who's confused? More than normal. <laughs> Go. If you need help, call on me. I'll come help you. Take this desk like my sister-in-law, who studies before she goes in for a physical exam. By the way, this is the short form. The long form has 160 questions. I've taken it more than 25 times. So I'm, 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 it keeps changing to a slight degree because I understand myself more than I did you know, with my parents taught me what I used to do or somebody else. To both sides. Yep, to both sides.
These are yours. Nobody else is going to see it today. <laughs> Although I'm willing to help guide you in this once you do all three inventories over the next three weeks. And uh, you can help guide others. And believe me, I know this works. I've seen people leave their vocations completely and start new vocations based on this, and they become successful. Do both sides. And as soon as you're done, look up at me because we've got to, I've got to help you score this thing. And then we'll, I've got a few things to add to it before we wind up at the end today. How many of you would like another hour? As you're fi finishing up, what you're going to do then in the box below on the second page is write in the letter that has the mo most points. So the first one was between uh, uh, E and an I. Whichever has the most points, that's the letter you would put in the first box. Then between the uh, S and the N, whichever letter had the most points goes in the second box. Then put both letters in there. Okay. We're going to move on and we're going to see your temperament. If you look at your four letters, mine happens to be ISTJ. I'm going to go to the other side. Uh, there's a, another two-sided page that has a description. So I would look under IS, ISTJ and read about me. Scored where you got your four letters. We got a problem. Okay. We'll wait. Well, what's not clear? What's not clear, folks, on scoring this? A lot of P's. We have a lot of P's. A lot of P's in the crowd. A J would be done. Neither right nor wrong. Whether you're done or not doesn't mean you're right or wrong. It's just part of who you are. Okay, one more time on those four boxes at the bottom of the second page of the temperament type indicator. You have four boxes. You, you the the letter that has the most points from the first section. So if you you look at the the E and the I, whichever letter has the most points, you write in the first box. Then you look at the S and the N, whichever letter has the most points goes into the second box. 
You do the same with the T and the F. The letter with the most points goes into the third box, and then the J and the P. Whichever letter has the most points goes into the fourth box. Okay. After you get the four letters in, and again, I am an ISTJ, I'm going to look to, at the next two pages to find out, find where I see ISTJ. So whatever you are, whatever your four letters are, you find it on the one of the six temperament types. Look up here. What is Jan? ISTJ? It's called the duty fulfiller. What do people who have their sense of duty do? Teach. I heard somebody say teach. Everything in their life is getting the job done. That's what it's about, getting the job done. Task-oriented. Task-oriented people. Within a time frame. We've had fun watching the Hallmark movies. On TV, they're all the same. <laughs> and and the, the guy, when whenever the guy gives her a ring and it's at a party or whatever, I look at Jen and go, he's in, he's in big trouble, isn't he? Because if, he is, if you're asking an introvert to marry you, you don't do it in public, even if you're an extrovert. Because how do they read it? He did this for himself, not for me. If he really knew me, we would have had a quiet candlelight dinner. On the other hand, if she's an extrovert, what do I do? Well, then there's a party if there's I'm an extrovert. As silly as this sounds, folks, it almost destroyed our marriage. This is the number one tool Jesus used to restore our marriage because I kept misreading what her motivation. She kept misreading mine. I thought everybody learned the same way. I thought everybody had the same outlook on life. Folks, look at this up here. There are 16 different temperament types. Do you know what that means? Let me tell you what it means for a minute. It means this. Only 5% of the world sees the world the same way you do. 5% of the people you work with, 5% of the people here in church, 5% of people in life have a similar outlook on things that you do. That doesn't mean you don't agree on the same things, they just have a different way of approaching it. Go ahead. You said you've taken this test more than once. Do you come out the same every time? Pretty much. Almost identical. I, I know what I am from before, and I've got two kids. Identical. Okay, let me explain to you why it changes. It normally changes because you know yourself better now than you did back then. Back then, when I first started taking this, I think, what did mom and dad tell me to do? Well, mom and dad, I was in junior high, I'd come home, my mom had still had my play clothes laid out on the bed. You know how embarrassing it is for a junior high boy? Okay? She was the duty person. It, but I thought that's the way it was to be with everybody, Edie. And I, I, I couldn't understand. So the first time I took this, I came out different than what, you're, what you would see now. Because I, once I finally realized, I don't have to be, that's not me. I'm not going to put clothes on. I'm not the duty person, per se. But I will explain to you what that means. So only 5% of the sees the world the way you do. Here's the second one. Your temperament is your default behavior and attitude when no one's telling you what to do. Now, you might say, well, at, at work, I'm, I've got lots of duties, and I get them done. Oh, yeah. You can be forced into a different temperament because of the expectation of others. But I'm talking about you. Saturday comes along. Nobody's telling you what to do. You have nothing on the calendar. You're totally free. How do you handle life? Do you sleep in or do you get up? If you're a duty person, what time do you get up? When the alarm, Seven, when the alarm goes off, even on Saturday. If you're not a duty person, when do you get up? <laughs> could, could happen at any time. Here's the problem. This is where we're failing in evangelism. This is where we're failing in marriages. This is where we're failing in relationships. Here it is, right here. Your greatest danger is to determine the motivation for the action of others based out of your temperament. If Jan had really loved me, she would have done this, this, and this. Do you think I ever said that? Yeah, I did. And she said that about me. Because we kept missing one another. She's the introvert, folks. I'm the extrovert. 
Yeah, I bet you didn't know that. <laughs> okay, Joy, you tagged me. Here's the problem, though. I'm also, I'm also, I'm an I, whatever you call it, INTP. The N for intuitive means that I'm always looking to the future. When you're married to somebody that isn't sensory, they're checking the numbers right now, A, B, C, D, and E. How do those two people get along when you want to do something? If we're going to go on vacation, what does the, I, the IS person do? Or plan. On Monday we do this, on Tuesday we go here, on Wednesday we do this. What about the person that's the extrovert intuitive? Well, let's see what happens. Now, has that ever created a problem in your relationships? Of course it does. People miss one another all the time. What happens in evangelism, what happens in evangelism or disciple making is we expect people to do it the same way we do it. And therefore, we misunderstand why people don't get it. You know, I, 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 I train people in Kennedy Evangelism Explosion. You know, you knock at the door. You got two questions you want to ask them, right? What's number, question number one? If you died tonight and went to heaven, and the Lord said, why should I let you into my kingdom? What would you say? And you get the answer, and if it's the wrong answer, you try to share more of the gospel. And then you got a second question. If they miss both questions and don't respond well, what do you say? Bye. And it rarely works that way. It can. I've seen people come to faith right in the spot. The vast majority, it took a lot of time. And usually, here's the bottom line. When I can figure out their temperament, I can then modify the way I share the gospel with them for them to get it. And that's a key thing. And most of us just don't quite understand that. One more thing on this. We're almost done. We've got to let you go today. Your temperament is not an excuse not to push yourself and try new things. You can't say, well, Pastor Tom told me I'm an introvert. I don't want to go to any party. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. You're going to get exhausted at the party much sooner than your extroverted you know, husband or wife. But you still go. And you still interact. And if you're an introvert... I mean, if you are an intuitive person, so I got this big dream of what we should be doing, understand she's not, and so what do I got to do? I got to take my dream and I got to break it down into parts that make sense to her. In marriage, they call this communication. What's the number one problem in marriages? Communication. Same thing. We're dealing with the same issues here. We have been totally in effect. Do you realize that in... 75 years of evangelism in America, the church has grown by less than 0%. Why do we keep doing the same thing over and over and expect different results? We don't realize people are different, and we've got to approach them that way. So these are the big ones. But that number three is the biggest one of all. You will, you will determine the motivation of someone out of your own temperament. Be careful not to do that. Try to understand how they think and how they look at things. When Jan and I were, uh, well, here's the truth. We had, what was the one thing we really got messed up on? One was like the birthday party thing. You know, when Jan had her birthday, our first church, I, I got all the people together. I had a big, big birthday party for her. You know, she didn't know it was coming. <laughs> it was great. She almost killed me. And Jan, how did you read that? What did you perceive I was doing? You were showing off for all the members of the church how much you loved me. Is that what I was doing? Probably not. But that's the way she perceived it. All right? My birthday comes along. What does Jan do? Go out for dinner with candlelight. Jeez, if she really loved me, she would have gone to the effort I did and brought all those people together. We could have had a really good time. She obviously doesn't love me as much as I love her. You see what you do with this stuff? This is where we have to understand. Okay, we're almost done. I gotta let you go because we gotta go upstairs. All right, uh, next week we talk about spiritual gifts. Today, I know it's Super Bowl, I know it's late in the afternoon. We're gonna meet just from four to five right here to pray about the elders and about the future of the church and all that we're doing, about Pastor Grigsby and his family. So come and join us at four, four to five. And then we have to head to Stillwater because that's where our son lives. So we're going out there taking them pizza because they have nothing to eat. So uh, we'll be watching the Super Bowl with them. All right, any questions before I let you go? Do not lose this. 
do not lose this. Keep this. You're going to add. You're going to come up with three different things by the time we get done. Thank you for these folks. Thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your tremendous word. Help us never forget who we are and why we're here. Amen.